Melissa, my wife, has uh, taught me to appreciate many things. One in particular are jigsaw puzzles. I don't know, are there any other jigsaw puzzlers out there today? Yeah, it's got to be minimum, what, 1,000 pieces, 2,500, right, for it to be a good jigsaw puzzle. And uh, she really enjoys putting a, a jigsaw puzzle together and enjoying doing that with her sometimes. And uh, what normally begins, the box gets opened and the pieces start to be sorted. And you always begin with what? The edges or the corners, right? And once you get the edges and the corners around, you have the framework from within which you can work and then work your way towards the middle. As we're going through Revelation, we can think about Revelation as a jigsaw puzzle, that there are many pieces to fit together, but unlike the jigsaw puzzles you can find at the department store, Revelation's foundation and framework stands in the middle. You don't work from the periphery back to the middle. No, you begin with the middle and work your way out. And that middle is none other than the Lamb who stands in the center of the throne. Amen? The lamb at the center of the throne is the one being, the, the object, the, the person with which all else of Revelation finds its place. So today, Revelation 8 through 11, we got a lot to cover, and there could perhaps be a lot of periphery that will make us want to go this way and that with could this have been that, and this symbolism here, and this date there, and that. But I want to remind us from the outset that Revelation's primary goal is to tell us about Jesus. And everything else in Revelation must fit around the center who is none other than Jesus Christ himself. So, with that introduction, let's look at Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was silence throughout heaven for about half an hour. Somebody was joking me, with me between, in, between services today that from this passage we know that men are going to get to heaven first, about half an hour before women. No, I, I said, no, that's not it. I, don't, I, I think that may be an interpretation, but that's not what the Bible is trying to communicate. Heaven is in awe and in wonder of what the Lamb has just revealed through the seals. And then John describes, I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. More on the trumpets in a bit. Then another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar, and a great amount of incense was given to him to mix the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and threw it down upon the earth, and thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and there was a terrible earthquake. Remember in Revelation chapter 6, we heard the cry of the souls underneath the altar of sacrifice. How long, O Lord, until you deal with the problem of evil? And God, in the same way that he responded in Revelation 6 and 7, is now responding again in Revelation 8. Those Prayers rise before God. Revelation 8 stands as a marker that when you pray, your prayers ascend before the God in heaven. There was an amen in the back. Your prayers ascend before the God in heaven. God hears you. And not only does God hear you, but God responds. Those prayers have a response. There's incense hurled back towards the earth. God is doing something about the problem of evil. Then... The seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared to blow their mighty blasts. Trumpets in scripture are used for communication. Today we use cell phones. Back then they used trumpets. When the children of Israel were in the wilderness wandering, God gave a set of instructions to, to tell them how to play the trumpets. You played the trumpet one particular way, and it was a gathering of all the people together. You played it another way, it was to signify that the sacrifice had been made. You played it a different way, it was a trumpet of warning. And Revelation picks up on this imagery, and these trumpets, as we'll see in just a few verses, begin to blast a word of warning. Impending doom and destruction is upon you. Listen up. Listen up. The warnings ring clear. Nancy Guthrie, in her book, Blessed, 
Page 123 says, when a smoke detector goes off in the middle of the night, you can't simply ignore it and go back to sleep. It is meant to rouse you. It is meant to warn you. It is meant to keep you from being burned and from having your house destroyed by fire. I can remember as a sophomore at university here at Southwestern, living in Miller Hall, the fire alarm going off at two o'clock in the morning. I was two other roommates, Jordan, you remember. There were two other roommates were in one of the, one of the suites and uh, the fire alarm goes off and one of my, like we all wake up, one of my roommates just bolts out of bed and like doesn't care who's behind him or in front of him and is just out of the building. It's like, thanks for caring about us. We appreciate that. I, my other friend is a little kind of, hey, we, we got to go. The fire alarm's going off. And we kind of sleepily go down the stairs and we cross the street in Hillcrest. On the other side of the street, we're staring back at the building, wondering which room is going to burn down and maybe we get a new dorm out of this. And a fire truck comes, they investigate, and they find out that somebody left the shower lawn for too long and it was too hot and there wasn't a vent and the steam had caused the fire alarm to go off. We were later thankful for the fire alarm, but in that moment, it was a little bit frustrating as we walked back inside to try to catch a few more hours of sleep before the next day. Warnings are important. They help to communicate information, to tell others about what is about to occur. A friend of mine who was pastoring in one of the Pacific Islands He's telling me about one of the, the first weeks that he arrived there. He had a meeting with the church leaders, and the church leaders told him, Pastor, you, one of your duties is to lead prayer meeting every week. And he said, fantastic. When do we meet? Is it, you know, 7, 6 p.m. in the evening? They said, no, Pastor. 4 a.m. on Wednesday mornings. 4 a.m. He said, oh, okay. And pastor, the way that you let everybody know that prayer meeting is about to happen is there's a bell outside of the church and we use that bell to communicate. Pastor said, okay. So Wednesday comes, he wakes up and he goes to the bell and he realizes the one question he neglected to ask was how do I ring the bell to tell the community that prayer meeting is about to happen? And so he gives it his, just, his best bell ringing. Just, I think this is, if I were to ring the bell and tell people about prayer meeting, this is how I would ring the bell. So, grung, grung. He's like, maybe should I do a couple more? Ding, ding, right? Three or four more times, then he just kind of waits. I wonder when people will come. And very shortly after that, he hears footsteps pounding the path towards the church, and a gentleman arrives out of breath, and he says, Pastor! Who died? <laughs> and the pastor, confused a little bit, it's just, what do you mean, who died? It's, it's time for prayer meeting. No, 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 pastor, you don't. The way you rang the bell told everyone that someone has passed away and everybody needs to come to mourn their loss. How do I ring it for prayer meeting? That's, that's what we're doing, right? Communication of warning. The message matters. How the message is communicated matters. So, we enter into the blowing of the warning, the trumpets, in Revelation chapter 8, verse 7, reads this way. The first angel blew his trumpet, and hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth. One third of the earth was set on fire, one third of the trees were burned, and all the green grass was burned. Then the second angel blew his trumpet, and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. One third of the water in the sea became blood. One third of all living things in the sea died, and one third of all the ships on the sea were destroyed. Then the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from the sky, burning like a torch. It fell on one third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star was bitterness or wormwood. It made one third of the water bitter, and many people died from drinking the bitter water. Then the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sea was struck, and one third of the moon, and one third of the stars, and they became dark, and one third of the day was dark, and also one third of the night. Then I looked, and I heard a single eagle crying loudly as it flew through the air, terror, terror, terror to all who belong to this world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. If we've seen a thing or two in the seals, now things are starting to break down. The earth itself is literally beginning to be touched by warning, fire, burning, destroying. And we seem to glean from these trumpets that a significant portion of the earth is, is concerned. A significant portion of the earth is, is touched by these warnings. 
And the common thread throughout all of these trumpets as they blow their blast is not necessarily how or, or what is consumed, but who and why it is being done. The constant thread through these trumpets that draws them together is the concept of one-third. You heard it over and over again in the last few verses. One-third of this, one-third of that. The first trumpet, one-third of the earth and the trees are affected. The second trumpet, one-third of the sea and the living creatures and the ships are affected. The third trumpet, a third of the waters. The fourth trumpet, a third of the sun, the moon, the stars, their light, the day, and the night. And also coming in the sixth trumpet, which we'll see in a moment, one-third of all humanity, all people, is affected. And looking at this, we can go real literal on one side and say a third of the earth is just going to fall off and a third of the sun is going to be, but all of a sudden we think about physics and things just don't quite measure up. Remember, revelation is given to us symbolically, that symbols portray the meaning. And perhaps as we look at the earth, the trees, the sea, the living creatures, the waters, the sun, moon, and stars, the very essence and nature of what constitutes an earth that provides for humanity begins to be affected. And the thread of one-third through these trumpets, I believe, denotes a quality of what is affected as opposed to a quantity of what is affected. Look no further than Revelation chapter 12 when the great dragon, that serpent of old, is thrown down from heaven, how many angels does he take with him? A third. And we begin to see, perhaps, what the warning is all about. Sigvitonstad Tonstad, in his commentary on Revelation, says, the surprise of the trumpets shows God bridging the gap. Remember, how long, O Lord, will you deal with the problem of evil? Not by making the gap smaller, but by ensuring, ex- and not by ensuring that expectations are met, but by making the gap bigger. The gap is bridged by revelation, and the content of revelation is not retribution. N.T. Wright puts it this way. Think of your worst nightmares. Now double them, and then imagine them coming true all at once together. That's what it's going to be like. This is God's way of letting evil do its worst so that it may eventually fall under its own weight. The common theme of the first four trumpets Revelation chapter 8 is that the Lamb gives warning of the agency of evil. God begins to reveal more and more who is the one perpetuating evil. It's not God. God is a compassionate God, a God of love. And as the trumpets begin to blast their warning, we begin to see perhaps who is behind the problem of evil. Then the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen to earth from the sky in Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. He was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless abyss. When he opened it, smoke poured out as though from a huge furnace, and the sunlight and air turned dark from smoke. Then locusts came from the smoke and ascended on the earth, and they were given power to sting like scorpions. They were told not to harm the grass or the plants or the trees, but only the people who did not have what? the seal of God on their foreheads. They were told not to kill them, but to torture them for five months with pain, like the pain of a scorpion sting. In those days, people will seek death, but they will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. The locusts look like what? Horses prepared for battle. They had what looked like gold crowns on their heads, and their faces looked like like human faces. They had hair like women's hair and teeth like the teeth of a lion. They wore armor made of iron, and their wings roared like an army of chariots rushing into battle. They had tails that stung like scorpions, and for five months they had the power to torment people. Their king is the angel from the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon, both meaning the destroyer. Now, I know there's some great artists in the room that can draw amazing pieces of work. Try your best at drawing what was just described. There's all kinds of different images from here and there and everywhere. And it seems to be that Revelation isn't necessarily depicting an actual thing that looks like this, 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 and that. But John is using his best language to describe what he is seeing. 
And at the end of this long section of the, of the fifth trumpet, the enemy's true identity as the destroyer is revealed. And this enemy, the destroyer, seems to be given permission and authority by God to unlock the literal gates of Hades and to bring forth an army intent on bringing mayhem and chaos and destruction to this earth. The enemy, in attempt after attempt after attempt, seeks to destroy all that God created. Sigvi Tonstad again, mere material and physical harm cannot be the main issue. This is a spiritual conflict that centers on perceptions and loyalties with the stakes so high that they are represented in material terms. Revelation describes a demonic reality. Nature has no creature like this, and the scorpions known in nature do not have the capabilities to inflict harm like the scorpions of the earth in Revelation. We see again that the enemy is intent on destruction and he raises an army of fallen angels to wreak that destruction. But how how does he fight this battle? How does he bring it about? Well, Revelation continues, verse 12. The first terror is past, but look, two more terrors are coming. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet and I heard a voice speaking from the four horns of the gold altar that stands in the presence of God. And the voice said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great Euphrates River. Then the four angels who had been prepared for this hour and day and month and year were turned loose to kill one third of all the people on the earth. I heard the size of their army, which was 200 million mounted troops. And in my vision, I saw the horses and their riders sitting on them. The riders wore armor that was fiery red and dark blue and yellow. The horses had heads like lions and fire and smoke and burning sulfur billowed from where? Their mouths. One third of all the people of the earth were killed by these plagues, but the fire and smoke and burning sulfur that came from the mouths of the horses, their power was in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails had heads like snakes with the power to injure people. Our alarm bells should be ringing. Where before have we seen a serpent who uses his mouth to destroy humanity? Look no further than Genesis chapter 3. The original falling of man, the serpent in the garden, wooing Eve towards him. Did God really say what you said he said? And we realize from this text, the mouths and tails described with stinging and the reference to snakes, that the enemy's main weapon is deception through words. In other words, lies. From the beginning, the enemy of souls has been lying to humanity about who God is. Perpetuating perspectives of a God that is not what is found in Scripture. And the enemy of souls also speaks to us lies about ourselves, that we begin to believe things that aren't necessarily true. Tonstadt again says, the antagonist in the cosmic conflict may breathe fire and smoke and sulfur in Revelation's expose. He may acquire chameleon characteristics, locusts one day, scorpions another day than horses, but he never lets go of his core identity. The sting of the serpent is related to his mouth, And the poison spewing forth is not snake venom, but words. And you don't have to look very far in this day and age to know that we are fighting a battle of ideologies, a battle of words. uh, Words are economy now. Words are economy, what drives humanity. I like how C.S. Lewis illustrates it in the screw tape letters. You know, screw tape, the senior demon is talking to uh, his nephew Wormwood and kind of talking about all the different ways that the enemy uh, kind of arrays itself to attack humanity. And he says this, this is the enemy speaking now. The enemy's servants, that's the followers of Jesus, follow the analogy, have been preaching about the world as one of the greatest standard temptations for 2,000 years. But fortunately, they have said very little about it for the last few decades. In modern Christian writings, though I see 
much, indeed more than I like about mammon, I see few of the old warnings about worldly vanities, the choice of friends, and the value of time. All that your patient would probably classify as Puritanism. And I may remark in passing, and may I remark in passing that the value we have given to that word is one of the really solid triumphs of the last hundred years? By it, we rescue annually thousands of humans from temperance, chastity, and sobriety. John Mark Comer puts it this way in his book, Live No Lies. Lies that come, from the form, that come in the form of deceptive ideas are the devil's primary method of enslaving human beings and entire human societies in, vicious, in a vicious cycle of ruin that leads us further and further east of Eden. Lies. That's what the enemy's armory is made of. Deception. Untruths about who you are and who God is. And notice Revelation 9, 20 and 21, the response. But the people who did not die in these plagues still refused to repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. They continued to worship demons and idols made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. Idols that can neither see, nor hear, nor talk, nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their witchcraft or their sexual immorality or their thefts. In other words, those who did not repent turned into the idols that they were worshiping. Because living lies makes us blind, deaf, and paralyzed. When we live lies, when we worship the idols of gold and wood and stone, it makes us blind to see the provision that Jesus has given. It makes us deaf to hear the gospel of good news. And it makes us paralyzed to move throughout this world. Nancy Guthrie puts it this way, the apocalyptic imagery draws back the curtain of heaven so we can see false teaching and deception as God sees it so we will see the real danger in it. Deception leads to spiritual and physical death. Think about it this way. You remember maybe as a kid someone said something to you on the playground that even in your mind right now, you can remember the feeling of someone telling you something. It was a lie, it was, it was a tease, it was a bully, some, something. But that word has stuck around with you for years. And when you run into difficulties at work or in your family, that voice of whatever that kid said to you kind of rises up in your head again. Because you've believed the lie. Whatever they said that wasn't true, you've begun to believe it. And once we believe lies, we begin to embody the lie and then make it reality. That's one of the greatest gifts that God has given humanity is that we can make unreality reality. You want to go make something? You can go make something. You want to go form a relationship? You can form a relationship. You can turn something that hasn't yet to be into something. Look no further than the bearing of children. Yet the enemy has used the most beautiful gift that God has given us to dig down into our souls to get us to believe things that are not true from the beginning but begin to become true because we perpetuate the lie. God, what are you doing? Six trumpets have passed. I thought you were going to respond to evil and you've only made the gap wider You've only revealed more and more that there is evil in this world and there is an agent behind that, someone who's perpetuating lies and deception. God, will you answer? And the resounding response of Revelation is, is yes. Franco Stefanovic in his book, Plain Revelation, says this, it is during these demonic activities that God makes a special effort to reach human hearts by offering the everlasting gospel to the earth's inhabitants. His mercies are still available. He hopes that sin-hardened hearts will respond and make a decisive turnaround. And then John sees an angel standing with one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. And he's described in similar ways as Jesus was described in Revelation chapter 1. And in verse 5, we pick it up. Then the angel I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand toward heaven. He swore an oath in the name of the one who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and everything in them, the earth and everything in it, and the sea and everything in it. He said, there will be no more, what? Delay. Other translations say, time will be no more. 
When the seventh angel blows his trumpet, God's mysterious plan will be fulfilled. It will happen just as he announced it to his servants, the prophets. Before the seventh trumpet is blown, there's an interlude. God's got to open up his plan to to show us how is he combating with evil. In that language, time is no more. What, What does that mean? I like how John Pauline puts it. He writes, the time no more of Revelation 10, 6 is announcing the close of Daniel's time prophecies in the context of the sixth trumpet. Thus, the close of the sixth trumpet ushers in the final events of earth's history. Revelation 10 is building a case based on the entire last five chapters of the book of Daniel. Ellen White puts it this way, this time, which the angel declares with a solemn oath, is not the end of this world's history, neither of probationary time, but of prophetic time, which would precede the advent of our Lord. That is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing in the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. The angel's position with one foot on the sea and the other on the land signifies the wide extent of the proclamation of the message. It will cross the broad waters and be proclaimed in other countries, even to the world. Daniel's been fulfilled. We live today on borrowed time. Jesus said, no one knows the day nor the hour except the Father when I will return. We live in the in-between, between what Daniel has prophesied and the coming of Jesus. And look, Revelation chapter 10, verse 8, then the voice from heaven spoke to me again. Go and take the open scroll from the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the small scroll. Yes, take it and eat it, he said. It will be sweet as honey in your mouth, but it will turn sour in your stomach. So I took the small scroll from the hand of the angel and I ate it. It was sweet in my mouth, but when I swallowed it, it turned sour in my stomach. Then I I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. It would be so easy for us, the Seventh-day Adventists, to, to place our, our current day message in our heritage. To go back and say, well, 1844 has been proclaimed. Christ is in the most holy place. Our, our message is done. There's nothing else for us to proclaim except to wait for Jesus to return. Yet the call of Revelation is to go and to prophesy again. Our mission is not complete. We are called to prophesy again. Because the world we live in today is life and death. It is high stakes. There is no kind of just float down the river of life and everything will be well. No, there is a mission to complete. A world that is in desperate need of Jesus. And how will God respond? What messengers will go? Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. I will give power to my two witnesses. They will be clothed in burlap and will prophesy during those 1260 days. These two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. Commentators are divided, scholars are divided. What do the two witnesses represent? Historically, they could perhaps be the Old and the New Testament that have stood the test of time and witnessing of God. They could also, looking forward towards the future, could possibly be two literal human being witnesses that stand up and proclaim God, and you can read the rest of what happens to them in Revelation chapter 11. Only time will tell if that future will happen. It it, it could. It's hard to say definitely because there are no future set this date and this thing is going to happen. There's another interpretation that says this is the church. This is God's church called as two witnesses through The testimony of two or three, a matter is settled. The two witnesses stand up. His church goes out and proclaims. Because in this world of life and death, people are making decisions. And go figure, in the world that we live in today, why do we need Jesus when I have a Roth IRA or a 401k? Why do I need Jesus if I've got a nice family and a nice home and a great church and a Great community to live in. Why do I need Jesus when all of my needs are met? Why do I need Jesus when I can go to the grocery store and buy any food that I want? Why do I need Jesus? It's the question this world is asking. And so here's the thing. N.T. Wright puts it this way. As with all radical regime changes, those who profit from the present one 
will need dire warnings if they are to realize the seriousness of their plight. Many human beings have placed their trust in what this world has to offer. And they're benefiting and profiting off of, of that. And so go figure. When I'm the benefactor of everything the world has to offer, why do I need to shift into and to go someplace else? Nancy Guthrie again, the trumpets are meant to rouse a sleeping world to respond to the gospel in repentance and faith. Those who are awakened to the dire situation of being outside Christ can find safety in him. Those who ignore these trumpet warnings will one day wake to discover that the seventh trumpet has blown and it is too late to find safety. But today is not that day. The seventh trumpet has yet to blow. Heaven is still open and available to all who would accept. Jesus is still extending himself to this earth to say, will you follow me? And Revelation 11 concludes this way. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. There were loud voices shouting in heaven. The world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. The 24 elders sitting on the third thrones before God fell with their faces to the ground and worshiped him. And they said, we give thanks to you, Lord God, the Almighty, the one who is and the one who always was. For now you have assumed your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were filled with wrath, but now the time of your wrath has come. It's time to judge the dead and reward your servants, the prophets, as well as your holy people and all who fear your name from the least to the greatest. It is time to destroy all who have caused destruction on the earth. Then in heaven, the temple of God was opened and the ark of his covenant could be seen inside the temple. Lightning flashed, thunder crashed and roared, and there was an earthquake and a terrible hailstorm. We get a peek into the most holy place. And notice what is put back in its right place is the Ark of the Covenant, God's promise to his people. And what was in the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments, the articulation of God's character and the way that he's ordered the world, a bowl of manna signifying God's provision for his people, and Aaron's rod, God's leadership over his people. All has been made right. The lies of the enemy have been stifled and God stands on his throne having reconciled the world to him and made right the order of this world. Saying, I've covenanted with his people and I've made the world right and I now want them to live in a world where there are no more lies. There are no more deception. That unreality does not become reality but reality stays reality. But the truth that I've created, the one that I have fostered and the one that I have grown, that is what will stand the test of time. So the invitation we have today, instead of sitting back and kind of watching the events of the world play out as if we're spectators at a sporting event. No, the call from God is to jump into the fray. We don't need to be combative about it and be like, we have the truth. No. <laughs> It's antithetical to who God is. He's a compassionate, loving God. No, God invites us to participate in sharing the Lamb's way that leads to life. That's it. That's the whole of the gospel and the call of Revelation is to follow the Lamb and to participate in the sharing of His way. Because the Lamb's way is the one that leads to life. Do you want to live? Follow the Lamb. Do you want life? Follow the Lamb. Do you want truth? Follow the lamb. Do you want to find the way? Follow the lamb. The lamb's way is the only way that leads to life. Thanks for stopping by. I hope and pray that this message was a blessing for you. If you'd like to see more content like this, we need your help. You can support the Keene Seventh Adventist Church media ministry by going to AdventistGiving.org, finding the Keene Seventh Adventist Church in Texas, and then putting in your donation to the media line. Your faithful giving and support allows us to spread the gospel online for you and others to participate in. Thank you for your continued support of the Keene Seventh Adventist Church.